Uh, just quick before I let Bucky take over at his library policy to wear your mask the whole time you're here. So um, just try to keep everyone safe during these times. So please just keep it above your nose, your mouth. Um, my name's Allie. I'm the program director here at uh, Allegheny County Library System. I don't know much about the B-52, so I've asked Bucky to come here and tell you all about it. We are doing a memory collecting uh, where we're going to bind the memories from some of the local residents here of the event. So if you would like to write up, type, or do an audio recording of your memories of the event, uh, we are going to be doing appointments for audio recordings after Bucky's presentation, but you're free to drop off your memories at any time. So, all right, Bucky, I'll let you take it over. Okay, I'm Bucky Shriver. Um, I was uh, a part of the 50th Commemoration Committee, and I was also part of a, another uh, unaffiliated group. There was only about four of us in that group. We called ourselves Friends of Buzz 1-4, and we took it upon ourselves to restore these monuments to these uh, guys that died in this crash. We, didn't, we knew that these flight crew family members were old enough that this would probably be the last time that they would ever be back. And some of these monuments were in pretty bad shape. And we just didn't want them to see these things and kind of give them the impression that nobody cared. So I was nine years old when this thing happened. So I have some memories of this thing. But of course, being nine years old, you don't understand everything that you're seeing and you're hearing. But, um, but I do have some salient memories from then. My most salient memory from that time, I guess, would be I remember us standing around the radio on our kitchen counter listening to the hourly updates from WFRB, hoping these guys had been found. And because I still remember how terrible the weather was that night. And you can really sympathize with those guys knowing they were stuck out in that weather with, uh, with you know, probably not the proper clothing and know how much per peril they were in. But anyhow, uh, if we can start with the, uh, the slideshow. Um, now, some there's definitely some people here that, that have some of the same memories that I have. Remember seeing these fallout shelter signs that had the capacity and everything on them. And I remember us doing the duck and cover drills at Barton Elementary School, where they would take you down into the lowest part of the school, which was near an archway uh, that led into the gymnasium. And they would show you how to get down on your knees and get in almost like a fetal position. Um, of course, at that time, I had no idea why we were doing that. If they had told me, I would probably couldn't have conceived of it. But I, I still remember doing that. And um, anyhow, this plane, this plane took off, Buzz 1-4 took off from Turner Air Force Base in Albany, Georgia on January 7th. And its mission was to fly across the ocean and go into its rotation pattern over Turkey and await for the go code. In the, in the event of a nuclear war, their mission would have been to um, fly up into southern Russia and bomb an air base in Tbilisi in the Georgia province of Russia and then crash land this plane in the Iranian desert and wait to be rescued, assuming there, there'd be a world to come back to. But um, this plane flew across the ocean. Uh, they landed it the following day at Moran Air Force Base in Spain for engine repair. They had engine problems. And it was there for three days. Well, while that plane was sitting on the ground over in Spain, Buzz 1-4 was sitting on the ground in Spain, this plane took off from Wichita, Kansas. They had four Boeing employees on board. It was a test flight. They had uh, sensors on the fuselage to test this plane to, uh, for against buffeting turbulence. Well, they flew over the Sangre de Cristo Mountains of New Mexico, and they retraced the path of a B-52 that had gone down almost exactly a year before. Well, even though that was in clear weather, the turbulence around those mountains, it, you can see it ripped the tail of this one off also, but this was a B-52H, which was the latest model. It had the stronger bulkhead in the back, and it had the shorter tail. And 
this one almost rolled over on his back. They were able to save it, barely able to save it. And with the help of uh, officers on the ground back in Wichita, they told him to lower the rear, lower the landing gear and lower the flaps to stabilize the plane. Well, they got, they had intentions of going back to Wichita, but the winds were too high. And so they landed in Blithville, Arkansas. But anyhow, the, the message here is that this demonstrates that had Buzz 1-4 had these improvements, if they had had these improvements, it still would not have saved that plane. It still broke the vertical stabilizer. Now with Buzz 1-4, it not only broke the vertical stabilizer, but it came down, hit the left horizontal stabilizer, broke it off. It wrenched that whole tail section off that plane. When this one hit the ground up here, the whole one third of that back of that plane was gone. It was shedding big parts about the last eight miles. So this had some positive effect, but losing that vertical stabilizer in the daytime is a whole lot different than losing it at nighttime in a snowstorm. So I can't imagine that, that it would have made a difference. Okay. But um, what I did, now take this for what it's worth. Don't take my word for the gospel, but I'll tell you how I arrived at this. I, uh, I took the Air Force, um, or the, uh, yeah, the Air Force, from the Air Force crash report, the radio transcriptions, and they're all time stamped. And if you go on to the website, buzz14.org, it's B U Z Z O N E F O U R.org, um, there's a video on there, video interview, and it shows a video interview with the co pilot. He said that plane was flying at 500 miles an hour. So I used an online distance measuring tool. And just to uh, check the accuracy of this, I compared this online distance measuring tool with distances that I'd measure with my GPS unit, and they come out exactly the same. But anyhow, I measured back and forth by the, the, the time of these radio transmissions, and uh, I measured the distance, and if you can, the red dot at the top is, uh, I think that's Phillipsburg, but anyhow, um, yeah, Phillipsburg. And then if you draw a straight line, you can see that plane flew a course that was almost parallel with Interstate 99. Now, what was ironic, in 1943, there was a B-17 crashed in Midland. These guys bailed out of that plane uh, up near Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania, which is near Evansburg. And it flew a course that was almost exactly the same as this. And the course of these two planes crossed about where the Maryland-Pennsylvania line is, and they crashed six, six miles apart. So this was the second one, the crash within six miles. But the B-17 didn't have bombs on board, and all five guys bailed out, and, and they, they made it out safe. But, um, okay, we can switch to the next one. But if you want to read through these, and these these radio transmissions are, uh, these transcripts are available on that website. You can download a copy of the Air Force crash report. It shows everything. It, it shows when this plane took off. But, um, and I marked some of these things on here. This would have been the crash site. Um, let's go back to three. Um, this would have been the crash site. This was where Robert Payne touched down. He walked north, uh, not, of course, not knowing which way to, to walk. He walked about a mile north, and they found him frozen to death out there on the, uh, the Poplar Lick Trail. This was the VOR beacon, and the other, the purple dot there, was where Melvin Williams' ejection seat was found. Now, he was the tail gunner, but he wasn't sitting in the tail gunner seat because there was no C ECM officer on that plane. ECM stands for electronic countermeasures. It was the electronic warfare officer. And that seat is, is right behind the pilot and co-pilot. In this plane, it faced forward. But anyhow, <coughs> I, um, I measured the distance with my GPS unit. And this was hard to believe, but there's an, there's an old copy of the Air Force crash report and it's got um, 
a debris or a, a debris and survival gear scatter pattern map. It shows where all these guys landed. Melvin Wooten, it was nine miles. There was nine miles distance between where Melvin Wooten landed and his seat landed. His seat went nine miles farther than he did. And, um, okay, we can go to the next one. Now, this is the VOR beacon up there at Grantsville. These things, uh, VOR stands for Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range. These things radiated like a radio signal in the 300, 360 degree radius. And these planes had an instrument where they would dial the frequency of this beacon in, and they had a course, devi course deviation indicator. As long as they kept that centered, he would fly right over this beacon, and then he would dial the next one in. Well, these things only had a range of about 150 nautical miles, so they had these things scattered everywhere. But um, Melvin Wooten was the first one out of that plane. Uh, the first... Um, Indication they had a trouble was 1:38 a.m. when they got a response from the plane and it was indecipherable and they said they could hear air rushing in the background. So surely that was Melvin Wooten had already blown his hatch off at that time. Um, but this was the newspaper um, from January 13th, Cumberland Evening Times. But um, Melvin Wooten's seat landed right across Pea Ridge Road from that navigation beacon. So that, that tells me that he was, they were navigating by that beacon and he bailed out very soon as he knew, well, the thing went upside down. He knew to bail out as quick as quickly as he could, but he was the first one out. But um, this was the model of the plane. This was a B-52D um, model. And this one I took down at Warner Robins Air Force Base in Georgia. And you can see how high that vertical stabilizer is on this thing. Um, and this, this is a view of uh, the cockpit and the tail gunner's pod. You can see these things are very austere. They're no frills. It's just everything is business with these things. But this is the flight crew, um, the pilot and co-pilot were the only survivors. Uh, Melvin Wooten froze to death in the Castleman River up there. He, uh, he hit part of the plane or part of the plane hit him when he ejected. He had a compound fracture of his left leg and his family members told me that he had cuts on his chest and his hands too. Um, but he drug himself 138 yards across that field and he saw a light. Well, there was houses right behind him, about 200 yards. But of course, being that time of the morning and being so dark, he couldn't see them. And um, so he drug himself toward the only light he could see, which was actually on the other side of the Castleman River in Salisbury. And I don't know, maybe there was snow on that, on that Castleman River, whether he didn't realize it was a river. He thought it was strong enough to hold his weight. But he tried to crawl across that, and he fell in, and he couldn't get himself out. And... He was the last one found, and they had to use a chainsaw to cut him out of that ice up there. Uh, Major Robert Payne froze to death out there on the, uh, the Poplar Trail. And I talked to two guys that, that waded down through that snow in the middle of the night, and both these guys are, are gone now. That was Gary Fence on Junior Brennan. And uh, after they, after the, uh, they brought the, uh, the co-pilot out of the woods. He was found about a mile from New Germany Road on Tuesday, the fall of the day after the crash. And he was in relatively good shape with the emphasis on relatively. Um, but anyhow, when they brought him out of the woods, Lester Biddinger went back home. He lived on Fairview Road. And Lester, when he went home, Tuesday afternoon, it started to clear up. And Lester... He went behind his house up on the hill, and he can look right down through Poplar Lick, and he saw another parachute, and he went back and told those guys. He said, there's another parachute down here. So they all, they, they got all their clothes together, and they got about 20 guys. Ten of them started from the New Germany Road Inn. Another ten started from the Savage River Road Inn. They didn't start walking through those woods until after dark. They were in those woods all night long. And Junior told me that uh, 
he said that he slipped and fell in popular liquor run. He said he was wet clear up to his knees. And he said uh, they found this guy early in the morning. And Gary Benzel told me that um, that he was like in a almost like a fetal position. Gary said he had a coat on that had a hood on it. But Gary's exact word, he said it was a real thin nylon. He said it wouldn't keep you warm on a cold summer night. And that guy was just down on his knees like this. He had tried to climb this hill and he slid down and he just didn't have the strength to get back up again. So they had a blanket that they had brought with them with hopes of finding him alive. And there was reason for for that optimism because they had just, just uh, what, less than 12 hours earlier, they had brought that co-pilot out of the woods in good condition. And so they cut two saplings, used this blanket to make a travoy, and they tied this guy's legs on that travoy, and they drug him out of the woods. And uh, Junior said he was, they were so cold they couldn't go on anymore. He said they had to stop two or three times to build a fire and uh, get warmed up again. And Tom, they got him out down by Savage River Road. It was uh, daybreak. And um, they landed a helicopter in one of those farm fields and took the body back to New Germany, up to New Germany Park, which was the headquarters. But um, Junior told me that, that he worked for the, the uh, Harbison and Walker brick refractory up on 495. And of course, he went home and got warmed up and got dry clothes on and, uh, and uh, got something to eat. And he, Junior said he uh, got to work two, two hours late and the boss made him work over two hours, make up for it. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty brutal. But um, yeah, just, uh, that was just, that just stands out to me as of all the heroic episodes, that one is, stands above everything in my mind because I know that they knew as long as they stayed close to that popular lick run that they would come out on Savage River Road. But if they would have got lost in those woods that night, they would have been uh, dragging a whole lot of bodies out of there. And uh, Junior said every flashlight they had went dead. The batteries went dead. Of course, the batteries back then weren't what they are now. And it was bitter. It was below zero. Temperature was below zero. And the only light that they had was a miner's lamp, far by the lantern that Junior had, had brought. And that mine, that lamp is still in the Grantsville Museum up there. But, uh, and this photo was given to me by the, uh, the co-pilot or the, the pilot's uh, grandson, Matt McCormick. In 1947, uh, Charles Lindbergh came to, uh, uh, trying to think of the, the Air Force Base up in Alaska, and uh, he wanted to take uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska, and he wanted to take a B-17 up for a flight, and he asked that the uh, most experienced B-52, B-17 pilot go with him. That was Matt's grandfather. On the on the right there, that's. Uh, the Cormick, uh, he was the uh, pilot of, the, of Buzz 1-4, and Matt said that uh, uh, he thinks that was his grandfather's proudest moment. Yeah. Now this is the old uh, the, the debris and scatter pattern map that I told you about. Um, it, for some reason it wasn't in the newest version of the crash report, but it was in an old one and uh, but it shows everything and it shows on here you probably won't be able to see it very well but it shows on here where uh, that ECMC was found it's marked so so we know exactly where that landed and it's in the Frostburg Museum it's in the Frostburg Museum <clears throat> when they took the plane out or the bombs out they uh, hauled them down to Cumberland of course on these flatbed trucks and they loaded them on this C-124. It was just like this plane here. And But the problem was, the plane's that big, they, they have such a, they need such a long glide slope, they can't just take off in a direct line because they'd hit the mountain. So this thing had to take off and it circled the airport to build altitude to, to be able to, to fly out of there. Now, 
like I say, I was nine years old when this happened. And of course, uh, after a year, uh, everybody kind of goes back to their lives and is talked about less and less. And um, but my experience with this was kind of renewed. The second the second phase of this happened here in August, this day in August. I think it was August 13th. Well, I came home this night, 1030 at night, and I had this email from somebody I didn't recognize. It said, we're in the uh, Grantsville. We're in Grantsville. We're staying at the Castleman Inn. We're looking for the B-52 monuments. We're from the Orange, Texas area. And it said, please call anytime. And anytime is capitalized. And I thought, well, it said anytime. It seemed pretty urgent. So I called. And here it was Gina Townley Swinburne. The niece of Major Robert Townley, that's the first time she'd been back in 49 years. And so she wanted, I told her, I said, well, it's going to be hard for you, for me to describe this to you. And I'm afraid you won't find them and you might never be back. I said, I'll meet you up there. So I took them around and that's Gina Townley Swinburne, her, her, uh, her husband Dave and her adopted daughters Haley and Nia. And Gina has been back. Three times she was back in the summer of 2020 again, and her sister came with it, with her this time, and that's the first time her sister's been back since '65. So I took them around to the monuments again. Now, when we were looking for uh, <clears throat> these flight crew families, we thought we had a good chance of finding this boy because this is Captain Parker Peden. His, uh, and his wife, Diane Britton Peden. And we thought, well, he's got to be, you know, he's maybe 60 years old at the most. And so we searched, and it just seems like he dropped off the face of the earth. And Gina was the one that figured this out. But uh, Diane Britton Peden and Parker Peden divorced in 1967. Well, uh, the following year, she remarried, she was remarried to Lieutenant Colonel Charles Arthur Colt. Well, here they changed that boy's name. And uh, because we didn't realize that boy was adopted. And so they changed that boy's name. And so then our hope was inspired again so we, we can find him. And then I searched and I found this, that he had died one year, almost one year before the 50th commemoration. So our hopes went, they were high and then they went low. And it was like a roller coaster ride. And we'd like to say, we, I don't know if he, he would have wanted to uh, attend, but we, we sure would have liked to ask him. Now, this was how we found this monument in uh, 2013. And it was actually worse than it looks. The cross was broken off the top. Um, it was laying on the ground on the back. So I set this up to take a photo and then I laid it back on the ground again so it wouldn't shatter. And then uh, we went back and we, we raised money and hired a professional conservator to uh, restore them. But we'll get, we'll get to that a little bit later. Now this, this was given to me by Gina Townley Swinburne. That's the Townley family at the dedication of the Robert Townley Monument. Uh, at the crash site in 1965. That is uh, Gina, Lisa, uh, Robert Townley's son, and his brother, and, uh, and other family members. And here was the, uh, here was the monument restoration. We hired uh, Howard Wellman from Howell Maryland. He's a professional conservator. He had done work at the uh, Congressional Cemetery and since one of these monuments was on state property, and I'm glad they did, they were strict about how they wanted it done, and I'm glad they did. Uh, but um, you can see in that previous picture, you can see there was a tire. See, there's a tire still laying off the plane there, and there's still pieces of fuel bladder and pieces of metal laying throughout that field. And you can see the sequential photos. We, he took it completely down. Um, Remortared it, uh, set it back up, mortared along the bottom where it was cracked. And what happened here was the cows were using it as a scratching post. And so um, you'll see the photos here. And then he drilled and pinned and, and mortared the top. 
and uh, the, the next one there's an, and my buddy Bill Davis back here was our went up and, and helped us. Uh, that's Bill, Mark Alexander, myself, and uh, conservator conservator Howard Wellman. But we uh, we made an agreement with the um, the property owner to keep these cows in until we could build a fence around it, so the same thing wouldn't happen again. There, there's the tire. It's still up there. There's some other photos. Mike, now Mike Beal from um, Salisbury did all the stone work. We had nothing to do with that. That was all Mike. Um, I think we have more photos. That's what a great job Mike did with that. He did all the flagstone. Yeah. Yeah, Mike did a fantastic job there. And that's what it looked like when we first got there to build the fence. That's, you can barely see that, that monument. And so we, we tramped some of the weeds down. And then the property owner, Frank Seguero, came around later and, and uh, with his tractor and stuff. And he, he maintains it. He cuts all the weeds around and keeps it all cleared out. Hopefully someday that'll, that thing will become uh, public. That was the end of the first day. Um, that's my brother-in-law. He helped us. He was really the carpenter there. I was just manual labor. He was the carpenter. He had the guy. He was the guy with the know-how. But there it was before, and you see the big rocks in the foreground. We dug out of that ground. Man, that was hard digging for two days. And that's myself, my brother-in-law Buck Burkett, and uh, uh, Eric Alexander from Western Board. Eric's dad was instrumental in getting these monuments uh, erected and he's also instrumental in that 50th or in that uh, ceremony they had in 1964 up there at Grantsville. He actually he wrote a letter to the White House asking for recognition for these guys and it was I was really surprised to find out that he got an answer and they sent the Air Force band and uh, and then uh, the speaker the guest speaker was uh, Woody Swancott and uh, General Woody Swancott, and they had a at the end of the ceremony they they had a B-52 did a low pass, so the military really stepped up in 1964 to recognize these guys. Is there any truth to it? I hear Frank was trying to sell the farm. Well, he was. Uh, I thought they had moved out at one time and moved back because uh, he had what he thought was a buyer at one time, but then it fell through. I don't think Frank, I, I think my impression is Mary doesn't like it up there, but I think Frank doesn't want to live anywhere else. That, that's the last I heard about that. I haven't heard anything for about two years. <coughs> now this <coughs> was the dedication of the Robert Payne Memorial out on Poplar Lake on July 4th, 1964. And these were some of the guys that were involved in going down there trying to rescue it. This is uh, Cecil Broadwater, um, Bob Warnick, Dayton Broadwater, Tom Bender, uh, Jim Michael, uh, Hank Hanwart, the uh, park ranger, and Blaine Beachy. And there's how we found the Payne Memorial in uh, 2013. It had a heavy coating of biota, which you can expect being close to that storm, but look what somebody did. A big gunshot fall there. Another one there. Somebody shot it with a shotgun. Um, so we uh, we hired Howard Wellman, and we had to cut some trees. The state said they get down and cut the trees, and somehow they forgot about it. But they they did come down. I contacted them. They come down. And they cleared it all away for us when we had to go again. Bill Bill will remember that cutting the trees. That, yeah. But we had to do it because we're paying this guy eleven hundred dollars a day plus travel expenses so we we didn't have an unlimited amount of money and that's Howard and you'll see the we'll scroll through these and restoring the monument and there it is today uh, the Bedford Pennsylvania American Legion donated the uh, the bronze Korean War flag holder and so I wish it was more accessible but still I want to see it um, I want to see it maintained. Now this one is publicly accessible. Uh, the Melvin D. Wooten uh, 
uh, monument. That was donated by uh, Johnson Memorials up in uh, in uh, what Myersdale or Salisbury, Myersdale. <clears throat> and uh, well, the Robert Payne Memorial was donated by Irwin Memorial, which today is Frostburg Memorials. And the one at the crash site was donated by Tri-State Memorials. But this one is probably the nicest one of all. And to get this one, to get to this one, you go north on 219 to Salisbury, make a left at the traffic light, go across the bridge to 669, make a right, and you only go maybe a quarter of a mile. When you go, when the road makes a sharp bend to the left, turn right on West Salisbury Avenue, you only go out there about an eighth of a mile, and there's a dirt road right next, just beyond the telephone pole, and you stop and you'll see a barn down there, and there's a new brick house. You look like you're going to somebody's private property, but just go down there, and when that road makes a bend to the left, that dirt road, you pull into this parking lot, and here is this memorial that they donated for him, but it's got a B-52, uh, a parachute, and an ascending angel on the stone. But I didn't realize until I talked to the guys at Johnson Memorials that somebody had shot this one up too. And uh, I didn't really think about it at the time, but I noticed that that granite marker, the upright part, is only about four inches wide. And after he told me that, I thought, most of them are a lot wider than that. He said, yeah, that's because we had to grind that thing down and reinscribe it after somebody shot it up. And just can't imagine anybody would would do something like that. Now, um, during the 50th commemoration there, I got, like I say, I, I took all the flight crew families around to the monuments, and I had dinner with the Wootens up at, um, at Sand Springs, and they told me about their brother. And he was the oldest child of uh, Melvin Wooten, and he was about seven years old uh, when this crash happened. And they said uh, they were inseparable and at that time, him and his father, and they said that had an irreversible effect on him. And uh, Jerry J. Wooten was killed in a car, car crash in Colorado in 1980. So the ripples of this thing, it's, it's just, it didn't end with the day of the crash or the, or, or the week after the crash. This thing went on for years and years. And another little bit of irony is whenever <coughs> Diane Britton Peden remarried to this Charles Arthur Colton, um, he was, uh, in 1979, March 29, 1979, he was flying a small plane for the North Carolina Department of Forest Services, and he, he crashed down there in North Carolina, and he was killed in that crash. So the irony there is, with this crash in 1964, it had a happy ending for her because he was her husband was rescued. But the second time, it didn't have that happy ending. Um, but something kind of to, to go back here, I talked to uh, the sister and also the cousin of the co-pilot. And uh, I talked to his sister, and she said, she said, I don't have a lot of memories of him because we were nine years apart in age. And time I was old enough to remember, he was off to college and then in the military and gone. And, uh, but, but one thing, I think it was, maybe it was Joyce. But anyhow, she told me, she said, contact his cousin, Joyce Bowman. He said, they were very close, and they were close to the same age, and they were very close. And I called Joyce and talked to her, and she told me a lot about him. And she said he was smart. She said, like, genius smart. And uh, she said she said he was a very fun-loving person. She said, if I could think of anyone to compare him to, it would be that Hawkeye Pierce on MASH. And she said that Mac Peden used to take her flying in his private plane, and he would swoop over his mother's house so low that she could look out there and see, her, see his mother out there waving her broom. <laughs> but um, yeah, but one thing Joyce told me, Joyce was a retired nurse and she took care of Parker Peden when he was released from Memorial Hospital. And she told me, she said, he wasn't in nearly as good a shape as what they made it sound. And she said he had frostbite on his fingers and on his toes when he, when he was released. Now this was the monument tour, 
Now this is uh, Melvin Wooten's widow, Carol, her oldest daughter, Deanna, and her youngest daughter, Debbie. Uh, Debbie was seven days old the day her father died in that crash. Um, and the other lady, that is uh, Major Payne's, uh, Terry, Terry Payne Chapman. She's the daughter of Major Robert Payne. And that's, and that's uh, Terry Payne Chapman and her husband, Bill Chapman, at the uh, Payne Memorial on Poplar Road. Now, there I am with the Townleys and the Wootens. This is, of course, Carol again and Deanna and Debbie. Gretchen Kinser, who is a niece of Major Robert Townley. Um, that's Gina, and uh, she's another niece, and uh, her daughters, Haley and Nia. And there, there are the Wootens. That's the Wooten family at the, at the crash site. Now, this one was taken at the Jesse Green farmhouse. Um, we went um, to the crash site with the families, and I went by and I saw Jesse Green's daughter's car sitting there at the farmhouse. And so we got to the crash site. I called them, and I said, I wanted to make sure you were home. I said, uh, you feel like company? I guess somebody wants to meet you. Of course, they had talked to him briefly the day before the 50 commemoration. But uh, I took them all over, and that's, uh, I I'm the West Norma. This is uh, Norma and, um, what's her name? Uh, Glenna. 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 Norma and Glenna. And that's uh, Dave Swinburne, uh, Gina's husband. And uh, like I say, there, that's, that was taken there to Jesse Green Farm. And this, Gina, this is Gina's photo. Gina took this photo of all the flight crew families up there at Grantsville. That was the uh, that was the day of the 50th commemoration. That's Major Townley's son Don, and that's his sons. Now this this picture was taken by my buddy who since passed away, Tom Neat. That was the uh, that was the C-123 that did the flyover up there at the commemoration. So that that was Tom Neat's. Tom just passed away less than a year ago, but he took that photo. Now this is the Knights of St. Andrew, and that's uh, Jim Bosley on the far side. Jim has since passed away also at the 50th commemoration. These are just 50th commemoration photos. That's uh, uh, Commander American Legion, uh, Lynn, Lynn Patton up there. This lady, are you, is anybody familiar with this Melissa Rank? She's an impressive lady. She spoke up there at that uh, 50th commemoration. She's a major general. In the Air Force, she was born and raised up in Shaft, and this, this she's a, an impressive lady. But that's that's her uh, doing her speaking part up there at the 50th commemoration. Okay, and this is uh, Marcy McClive. She was the uh, bagpiper up at the uh, 50th commemoration. On the, uh, the day before the, the 50th commemoration, I went around and took photos. Well, I, I, I did these photos of the flight crew families that we hung on the wall up at Appleton. And what I did was I printed the photos off and had them all glued to, to foam board, hang them on the wall. But anyhow, I realized the day before that I hadn't taken a picture, hadn't taken a picture of the memorial up there in Grantsville. And so I was taking this picture and this plane kept flying around. And I thought, what the heck is that? I thought I got Air Force markings, so I put my long lens on. And I didn't realize that at the time, this was the guy that was going to do the flyover the next day. And he was scouting the area. And as you can see, I got a lucky shot there. He's looking down at me when I when I got the picture. And what was more ironic about this. When this was happening, I got this picture, and I heard this car pulled in, and I turned around, and here was Gina Townley Swinburne, just got there from Louisiana, just just pulled in. Now these are the Air Force crash reports. You can we can probably scan, scan over these, skim over these. I've got a copy of the uh, uh, 
the radio transmissions here, it'll tell you, um, you know, the times and stuff when they ran into trouble there. But um, if you look at these, uh, where these guys landed relative to the crash site, especially Robert Payne, he, uh, where he touched down at was only two and a half miles from where this plane went down. And that would lead you to think that he waited till the very last minute to eject. But what you got to consider, and, and I, I had to think about this for all, what you got to consider, these guys, when they ejected out of that plane, needless to say, you're being propelled forward at 500 miles an hour. That's how fast that plane was going. I can't even can see how somebody's body can stay intact in a 500 mile an hour wind. But they, and how far, how far forward, maybe somebody with a background in physics could make some kind of a estimate of this. How far forward would they have had to go before they lost their momentum and started falling straight down? Um, I would say easily six or eight miles forward because when these guys bailed out, when they first started bailing out, this plane was at 30,000 feet. And these parachutes, these T-10 parachutes, they had a barometric control on them that was set to open that parachute at 14,000 feet. Now that's 14,000 feet above mean sea level, not 14,000 feet above the ground. So considering all the terrain up there is at least 2,000 feet high, um, these guys had to these guys had to fall probably what from 30 30,000 feet to probably at least 14,000 feet before that parachute was going to open. And then uh, and once it opened, they would descend at like 13 to 1500 feet a minute. So another eight minutes under that parachute with the northeast wind blowing you farther south. So um, long story short, he didn't bail out. He didn't wait nearly as long as what it would appear because these guys were carried a long way along with the path of that plane from the time they, they bailed out of this thing. Now, what was the theory of the fifth guy did not eject? Um, well, he was out of his seat, and the, and the pilot and co-pilot testified later. He was out of his seat to use the latrine. And at that time, they granted the request because at that time, there was no request, there was no turbulence, so there was no reason to deny it. But this stuff all happened so quick. And he and Robert Payne are down in the belly of this plane in this black hole. And it's very cramped down in there. And with this plane, and this thing all happened so quick, and that tail breaking off, that he couldn't get strapped back in his, in his seat again. And I asked his family, I said, I read, I said, I read in some of the reports that he had some of his belts hooked, but not all. And, and they said, that's what we were told. But this, this is the Buzz 1 Ford Memorial Trail. We did have some trifold maps, but you can actually go on uh, the Buzz 1 Ford website. And again, it's all letters, no numbers, B-U-Z-Z-O-N-E-F-O-U-R.org. And you can click on this map and you can navigate to all these places where these events happen with this crash with your, with your cell phone. It's got GPS coordinates, driving directions, everything. Now, the townies were back in 2020 and there we are up there at the, the crash site up there, Frank Scare. And of course, that's Frank on the other side. And this is Lisa Townley Gilbo. She's a niece of Major Robert Townley and Gina and uh, their adopted children and grandchildren. Yeah, that was just a year and a half ago. They were back. They love it up here. Do we have uh, the video? Uh, on, on there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I feel like, uh, well, here's, here's one thing I missed. Um, I didn't realize this. Gina told me about this story it was in Popular Science Magazine in 1957. And the, the cover story says, a night raid and our hydrogen bomber. And uh, they talk about Major Robert Townley in there. They had this course set up. I think it started in at Westover Air Force Base, and then they had to go to St. Francisville, Illinois, and then Richmond, Virginia, I think, Richmond, Virginia, 
and then Montreal. They had this set up like in a in a baseball thing, and it was called the World Series of Bombers, and it was a competition among the best B thirty six and B fifty two uh, bombers. And anyhow, they they uh, they had radar trucks set up in each one of these locations. When the plane got over these locations and the bombardier would hit that button. Of course, there's no bombs on board. It would send a signal to that radar truck to, to check the accuracy. And Robert Townley was the only one to score a perfect strike. And and that and there's a story in there. It's got his picture in it. Now let me tell you a story, a little bit of story behind this footage. <clears throat> there's a there's an interesting story behind this footage. A friend of mine, Leo Mills, told me that he had eight millimeter video from that B-52 crash, and I said. How did you get that? Because they were seizing film out of cameras. And he laughed. He said, he said, there's a story behind that. <laughs> he said, he and his dad and his uncle were right uh, shooting footage. They had, his dad and his uncle both had eight millimeter bell and house. And a sentry saw them. And he came up to Leo's uncle. He said, you shooting video? And he was on. So he said, yes, sir. He said, give me the camera. And he ripped the film out of it and gave it back to him. Well, he asked Leo's dad the same question. And Leo, Leo said that his mom had sewed a pocket on the inside middle of the back of his dad's hunting coat. And that's where he had that camera. Well, he lied to that guy. He said, no, I'm not shooting video. Well, the guy frisked him and never found it. And that's where this video came from. Is it the day after? Yeah, he said it was the day after. Now, there's footage here. You'll see it coming up. Some interesting stuff. One of the guys on our committee up there was George Menser from Myersdale, where he retired B-52 mechanic. I had to ask him some things to clarify what we'll see. And we pause it there for a second. Now, see this? I asked George, I said, what is that? I said, those B-47s were white. He said, I think that's what it was. He said, when the B-52s came out, the B-47s were obsolete. And so what they did, they 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 uh, converted them over to RB-47s, and they had high-definition cameras on them, and they were reconnaissance plane. And I read in the newspaper archives back then that they did have a B-47 flying over, especially trying to find Melvin Wooten, taking high-definition video of that. So George said he thought that was a B-47. That was the day after the plane went down? He said it was a day after. It must have been uh, like in the afternoon because it looks kind of clear. Now, this one was on Swamp Road across from where Wilson Warnick lived in that trailer up on the hill. This was a piece of the fuselage. looked like 15 feet long. See those black windows right there? Look like windows. I had asked George, I said, what are they? He said, that's the chaff dispensers on that plane. This broke off, and you'll see the cameraman, Leo said he... He thought he was holding the camera. It pans back north, and you'll see this big swath of trees this thing knocked down. See the swath mm -hmm. of trees that thing knocked down? The whole one third of back of that plane was gone the time it hit the ground. So it had to take a severe nose down attitude. I added this in there just to show the kind of equipment they had up there to, to uh, get rid of that snow so they could get in there. Now this is up in Appleton. This is the empennage, and that's a that's a word I learned from George. I'd never heard that before. That's the whole tail structure that holds the vertical stabilizers and the gunner's pod and everything. But if you see here, uh, now this is a vertical stabilizer landed in the woods along Green Lantern Road. And Leo told me where that was, where it was found at. If you go from right 40 and turn up Green Lantern Road. Before you get to Avalton, Lona Coning Road, uh, you get down in a big dip. Leo said it was down in that big dip over in the right in the woods, and he said that thing split a tree and it stood up. And somebody else told me that they must have come and knocked it down to keep it from falling somebody. You see it was laying down. Where were the bombs located? They were landed right in the middle of the debris, in the debris path. Now this, Asa Wilhelm was operating 
the road grader, and uh, Bob Foot told me that. Bob's been a great help with this. Bob was the one that plowed the road up there so they could get into the grass site. Now, this helicopter, I, I, George said, uh, he said, that's a Piasecki. He said they called him a flying banana. He said they're made for uh, cold weather troop transport. So George was a great source of information, too. Things I would have never known. Yeah, this all came from Leo Mills, all this footage. Did they ever come back and question it? No. Mm -mm. Back to now, now, this is up at the Frostburg Armory. Now, you'll see this pan a couple times. This is not panning the same debris pile. These are separate piles. You see how big that first pile is? Now, now watch. This is a separate pile. And at the end, at the end here, you'll see the engines. Where did they take all that stuff to? Honestly, I don't know. I, I, I heard they had, there, there's the engines right there. I, I'm, I'm really not sure. I Probably, maybe, I don't know, Fort Meade or, you know. Did you ever hear how much the plane and all would have weighed? Because you just lift up them three pieces there and they are heavy. You know what? It's on that Buzz 1-4 website, how much that plane laid and weighed. And, um, you know, um, what was interesting is that there's a lot of in misinformation that was perpetuated through the years. And, of course, the military is not going to confirm or deny anything. Mm -hmm. And it was always reported that, um, and this was, 19, this was 1965. I'm guessing it was 65 because that, that monument wasn't dedicated until 1965, so I'm pretty sure that's that's Leone's family up there at the crash site. But it was always reported, and uh, this got this got perpetuated a lot of different stories. That this plane had 24 megaton bombs on it, but they never had a 24 megaton bomb. They had 25 megaton Mark 41, but they hardly ever used that. But we looked at the weights and measures on an Air Force crash report and awaited those bombs and we found out that there were actually uh, Mark 53s, which is a nine megaton bomb. These bombs, each one of these bombs was 600 times more powerful than what they dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now when you, when people hear that these bombs weren't armed, they get the wrong impression. Uh, I've even seen them in official reports. One guy was a physicist on the, uh, worked on the Manhattan Project, and he's talking about warheads with these bombs. And uh, I can't believe a guy with his stature would say something like that because there's no warhead on a bomb. Missiles have warheads, bombs don't. But, every, but people get the wrong impression. I've often heard people say about these bombs up here, they didn't have the warheads on. But everything to make them work was there. When they say they're, they're not armed. All that means that pile, that bombardier has got a switch. It's got two positions, arm and safe. And as long as it's in a safe position, then it when he turns to the arm position, it starts an electronic sequence in that bomb. And that switch was disabled. The switches that would allow them to drop the bombs were disabled. That's all they mean by not being armed. And what makes these bombs more powerful than the ones they dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? These are not just nuclear, these are thermonuclear. But what that meant, these had a conventional explosive integrated into them because they, they learned through experimentation that under very high temperatures that this fission was greatly enhanced, which made these bombs so much more powerful. Now, the nuclear part in itself couldn't have gone off but the, but the only thing that stopped that can, those conventional explosives from going off and scattering that nuclear waste everywhere, that radiation everywhere, was the fact that those bombs were insulated by that snow. If they would have got in the middle of that fuel fire, they would have exploded. They had, that happened in Spain in um, 1966. They had a plane went down, B-52 went down. It, it jettisoned all four bombs. Two of those bombs exploded. The nuclear part didn't, 
But that conventional part, it got, I guess I got into fuel fire. They did explode and they scattered. Uh, it was, uh, it wasn't plutonium, <clears throat> might've been plutonium, but it, it, it spread that nuclear radiation. They said within a mile, square mile area, but I would think it's a lot more than that. But, um, so this could have been a whole lot worse than, than, than what it was. Yeah. That was the end of the video. Okay, but uh, I'm trying to think what else. I know I'm skipping a lot of stuff here, but I got stuff here. You're welcome to to look over here um, if you want. And I got a letter from uh, the Copout sister, and she told me that she was a student at St. Andrew Methodist University down there when the crash happened, and they didn't tell her about the crash right away because she was going to take her exams and there was no point in getting her upset and you know hurting her her performance there on her exams and she said by the time she found out about it, they the next day had to rescue so that would just save her a whole lot of worry um, you, you're talking about the disarming the bombs at the 50th reunion the guy that disarmed those bombs was there and spoke. Yeah, and no, I was disappointed. I want to thank you for doing that because I wouldn't be here if that sucker went off. He said, well, I sure wouldn't be here because I was sitting on the sucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, he was from Hagerstown, and uh, he died about a year ago. Yeah, he passed away about a, about a year ago. And um, like I say, there was a lot of misinformation that was perpetuated because of the nuclear secrecy back then, and this Sterling Queen is, he is the most interesting guy that I've ever talked to. He was a major in the West Virginia Civil War Patrol, and they uh, they stood guard up here three days because the weather was so bad, the regular military troops, it just took them a while to get here. And um, he told me a lot of interesting stuff. Now, I don't know what story is true, but I've heard this story about Ray Jaconi hauling those bombs out of that field in a dump truck, and this came from Sterling. This is Take for what's worth what he told me. And he broached the subject. I didn't. He said, you remember that story about him hauling those bombs out of that field in that dump truck? And I said, yeah. He said, it never happened. He said, he said the uh, 28th EOD unit from Hagerstown came, worked on those bombs. And when they told us they were safe to transport under mil military supervision, they had us wrap chains around the bucket of a loader, around the bombs, set them by the road. The, the, the road and set them on the trailer. So which story is true? I don't know. I, I seen them going up to the county though. They said my best way didn't they? Oh, they did. But and and again, I don't know what to make of this. I'll just tell you what he told me. And again, he broached this subject. He said, he said, you remember all that fuss about those bombs coming down through county? I said, yeah. He said those weren't the bombs. He said they told us to do that. He said that was a ruse. <laughs> so take it for what it's worth. That's what that's what he told me. <clears throat> and something else he told me, um, it makes you think. I don't like to say, just this is what he told me, tell you for what it's worth. He told me that every guy in his unit who stood guard up there died of cancer. I, I personally, I doubt it had anything to do with the, the nuclear part, but there was a whole lot of unburnt jet fuel. We were up there digging these holes for these fence posts up there, and you can still smell that jet fuel on the ground. You imagine what it was back then. That plane's capable of carrying 40,000 gallons of JP4. And these guys are standing up or breathing that stuff. And so, but uh, yeah, Sterling, Sterling passed away in, in October. He said he was scared to death. He said, we're just a little Civil Air Patrol unit. And he said they ran a phone line from the intersection of Swamp Road and Western Port Road down through that field, he said they had a phone hung on the side of the tree. He said, I was talking to Curtis LeMay, the head of the whole Air Force. He said, I was scared to death that we were going to do something wrong. And he told me a lot of stuff, but there's, he would still, he would start to tell you a story. He would go so far and he would say, that's all I feel comfortable saying. He was still afraid to say some things. And there's still, hundreds of pages of that Air Force crash report that are redacted. There's still things that they don't, they don't want to say. 
But uh, yeah, check that website and there's a lot of information. Uh, John Jocelyn, who was on our little one unaffiliated committee that got the monuments restored. Um, well, first of all, he, he raised most of the money to get the monuments re restored. And you'd be surprised where the money came from. A thousand dollars came from Associated Gun Clubs of Baltimore. 400 from the Baltimore County Fish and Game Association. John was like a um, legislative representative for them. He would go to uh, the uh, sessions of General Assembly and, and uh, you know, he would testify on, you know, you know, on their behalf uh, pertaining to bills that affected them. And so he, he got that money. And then I got $500 from the Governor's Commission on Merit and Military more monuments we had a couple private donors and then the rest we just dug in our own pockets and we raised uh twenty eight hundred dollars in five weeks to get them all fixed but john john created that website he paid he he paid to have it created he paid for the maintenance of it he did that all himself and he, he, he's still doing it. but there's a, just a ton of information on that on that website Thank you. Thank you. I always feel like I'm thinking there's so much of this. I always feel like I get back later and wish there's something I'd have said. But I, uh, I gotta go. To the <clears throat> you want me to let this here for a little bit, or what do you want me to do? Or you come, you coming back? Uh, I won't be back today. I can get, I can get it Thursday. How do you? I can get it Thursday, you know, Web Spiker always comes in to get books. Yes, yes. I'm Jenny with him. Right. Oh, okay. All right. Richard. Thank you, Richard. Yes. Where did you find these pieces at? Is that off Up Jesse? on Jesse Green's farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Richard. They had a couple wheelbarrow loads of them. You want to